Communism's rejection of religion is a feature, not a fault of the ideology, wrote Karl Marx. In 1949, the Communist Party took over China and began purging what it called colonial and traditional remnants from society. That year marked the end of diplomatic relations between China and the Vatican. Two years ago, on September 22nd, the 70-year-old impasse was broken when representatives of the Vatican and China signed what was called a provisional agreement. Now, here's some perspective on the secret deal, the details of which have never been made public. You couldn't really accuse Mao Zedong of being subtle. In 1949, after Mao's Communist Party's takeover of the country, religion was purged from China. Institutions deemed enemies without guns were specifically targeted. The Catholic Church was right on top of that list. Churches were brought down or repurposed. Catholic and Protestant priests, among other religious figures, were arrested and expelled or sent to camps. In 1957, the Chinese government established the Chinese Patriotic Catholic Association, which rejects the authority of the Vatican as deemed acceptable by the Communist Party of China. Those who didn't sign up became part of an underground church. Today, China's 12 million or so Catholics are divided between these two churches. Members of the underground church who profess fealty to the Vatican are part of unregistered religious groups that continue to face varying degrees of harassment as evinced by the ongoing crackdown on Uyghur Muslims and Tibetan Buddhists, among others. China's diplomatic relations with the Vatican, severed when the Communist Party took over in 1949, have not been re-established. Finally, two years back on September 22, 2018, Pope Francis signed off what was called a provisional agreement with the People's Republic of China. The agreement was signed by me, at least a plenipotentiary letters to sign the agreement. I am the person in charge. The others I mentioned earlier have contributed to it for more than 10 years. It's not an improvisation. It's a path, a real path. Reportedly, the agreement gave the Chinese government a say in the selection of bishops in China, and the Vatican presumably got some impetus in a normalization of the life of the church in that country. Today, for the first time, all the bishops in China are in communion with the bishop of Rome, with the successor of Peter. And Pope Francis, like his immediate predecessors, looks with a particular care to the Chinese people. In contravention to the 1980 Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, neither China nor the Vatican ever released the contents of that agreement. Now, as the two-year term of this opaque agreement comes to an end, both sides have made statements that indicate it will be renewed. The Chinese side has always been sincere about improving Sino-Vatican relations. In September 2018, China and Vatican signed a temporary agreement on the appointment of bishops, which is an important step in the process of improving relations. China is willing to engage in constructive dialogue, enhance understanding, build mutual trust and improve bilateral relations with the Vatican. The Vatican's willingness to do so has come under criticism on account of China's less than stellar record on human rights and religious freedom. The Chinese government has removed crosses from church edifices in provinces around the country and made it illegal for children up to the age of 18 to participate in any church or related activities. Members of the underground church have been historically told by the Vatican to resist the communist government. Now, these believers are being told by the Vatican to come out in the open. If they want to take over this place, then they will demolish it and we will have no place to worship. Why the Vatican seems keen on the renewal is obvious. One-fifth of the world lives in China and the Catholic Church would like to keep up with the growth of Protestantism in China. Estimates range between 28 million and 100 million Chinese who've embraced that faith. What's in it for China is an interesting question. The Mandarins and the Communist Party are certainly interested in taking charge over an underground church that has so far eluded its control. And how better to do that than to co-opt the Vatican itself? the Communist Party is officially atheist, but it sees the Vatican as a powerful institution that can be manipulated for political purposes. 
And that's where the rub lies, politics. You see, the Vatican is the only state in Europe that recognizes and has diplomatic relations with Taiwan. It's a fair conjecture that downgrading the people mission in Taipei will bring diplomatic recognition by Beijing. It's also possible that the reason the Vatican hasn't done so unilaterally is to have a bargaining chip when it sits down at the table with China. The irony of the whole thing is this. Both socialism and its revolutionary cousin communism rejected religion because the philosophies maintained that religion not only reaffirmed a classist society but made people accept their fate instead of trying to push for reform or revolution. Marx's famous quote about religion being the opium of the people is rarely quoted in context. Here's what he said. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature the heart of a heartless world and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. Today, the gap between the haves and have-nots in China has never been greater. With lack of credible data, it's hard to find figures, but in 2014, according to the Institute of Social Science Survey, Peking University, 1% of the Chinese population possessed one-third of the country's wealth. Those figures, if they haven't gone up, still make China one of the worst in the world when it comes to income inequality. Ironically, the Communist Party might in fact need religion to keep a lid on growing social unrest and reaffirm its authoritarian regime.